All right. Um, hello, everybody, and welcome to my talk. It's called Taming Real-Time Logging, uh, Lessons Learned from the Trenches. Uh, my name is Chris Apple, and in the last year for my company, I implemented a real-time logger, and I'm hoping to share those lessons with you today. So first, a little bit about me. My name is Chris Apple, like I just said. I'm the lead audio software engineer at Spatial Inc. We design playback and content creation tools for immersive soundscapes that evolve over time. If that sounds interesting to you, please reach out after the talk. I've got eight years experience in the audio industry, split between Dolby, Roblox, and now my first startup experience at Spatial. Um, I'd say I'm a specialist in immersive audio. I've spent a lot of time in immersive audio doing playback and content creation in multi-channel audio formats. So diving right into the topic at hand, uh, why do we need a real-time logger? Uh, you might ask yourself, I have a logger, it's perfectly fine, uh, why, why do I need to even listen to this talk? Well, there's a few reasons why you might need this. Uh, in your real-time log, where you're, or in your real-time thread, where you're processing audio, you might want to do some diagnostics. Maybe your reverb algorithm fails, maybe some parameter being set failed, and you want to log error occurred, send some help. If you've ever diag diagnosed any issues after the fact, you know it's horribly uh, bad to uh, get a log and not have an event in there saying what went wrong. Uh, next, metrics. At Spatial, we're really big on metrics, and one way to do metrics is to write a little blurb out to a log and have some other process scrape it and forward it up to the cloud. So specifically, we're always uh, measuring average and peak render times, and this gives us a good platform to profile and improve our code over time. Last, and the reason that I really took on this task was at Spatial, we allow our code, our, our users, to write uh, Lua code to evolve their scenes. And uh, specifically, we had a content creator who kept leaving log lines in their Lua messages, or in their Lua scenes, and I like to call this logs you can hear, because when they played back, it was just horrible dropout after horrible dropout. Um, of course, you gotta fix the content, but it'd be nice if we didn't get into that situation to begin with. So let's take on version zero, the most simple form of logging. Let's say you're taking the very, very naive approach and this is the real-time logger that you came up with. You can see the call down here. Of course, we want variable arguments and things like that. We're gonna say hello world from our real-time callback. But uh, this version zero is just a simple wrapper around printf. This is all it is. It's the world's simplest logger. It's the, the most straightforward way. Well, when we're evaluating these things, we might want to say, uh, well, um, are there system calls, are there allocations, or are there mutexes? And we're all in this room, we're all audio engineers, so we all understand that we can't do time unbounded operations in our real-time thread. There's tons of talks about that, I'm not gonna go into all the details for now, you'll just have to trust me. So. If we're looking at this first attempt, we might say, are there system calls? Yes, printf, we're gonna ask the operating system, hey, I'm gonna write out to the terminal. Uh, there we go, red box, we're, we're totally blocked here. But furthermore, as audio engineers, we wanna be a little bit skeptical. We, we can't just trust anything that we're given from the standard library, so we'd probably say, are there allocations going on in printf? Uh, I don't know, maybe, that, that, that's enough to disqualify it. And are there mutexes? Again, same answer, I don't know what the operating system is doing uh, when I call printf, so I have to assume the worst. So let's take on the first improvement and maybe the biggest improvement towards our real-time logger, using a logging thread. What if we took all of that bad behavior and pushed it off on another non-audio rendering thread? That might look something like this. We have our audio thread coming along and calling a method called real-time log. Now, instead of printing directly to a file, we are going to enqueue some blob of data into a queue for processing later. Meanwhile, we have the logging thread coming along and periodically calling DQ on the same queue and printing it out whatever format you normally use, printf, cout, log, etc. But crucially, because we're synchronizing across threads here, we have to use a lock-free queue. One of our criteria is we don't use locks, but we also don't want race conditions in our code. So a lock-free queue is crucial. 
When I was doing research for this, I came across Reader Writer Q, written by this lovely human, Cameron314. If you're ever watching Cameron, thank you for the lock free Q. Uh, it has a couple APIs that are really, really important for us as audio engineers, uh, in that you can reserve space for it up front. Here, we reserve 100 elements in the queue at initialization time. And it has an API to try to enqueue. So here it tries to put the number 18 in the queue. And if it fails, it just fails. There's no allocations performed. And this is super, super important because we cannot have allocations when these happen. So uh, if you're ever interested in the dark, dark magic of lock-free programming, highly recommend he wrote an article called A Fast Lock-Free Queue for C++, where he goes into the design of this lock-free queue. It's a really great read. So how might this look in code? Well, we're going to create some struct we'll call logging data. It contains whatever custom types we use. So at Spatial, we use a log region and a log level. Think debug, crit, whatever you normally log. But crucially, we're going to have a fixed size character buffer that we're going to print our message into. That fixed size is really important so we don't allocate. So this is our real-time log function now. So we are going to fill in our custom data and then use VSN printf to instead of print directly to the terminal, we're going to print into the buffer instead. So you can see that here. And at the very, very last line, we are going to take this uh, new data that we just created and put it into our lock-free queue. Meanwhile, while that's happening, in the bottom pane, we have our logging thread. And while this thread is alive, all it's doing is going through emptying the logging queue anytime that there's something in it. And in this case, it's calling C out to log. So all of the system calls and all the mutexes and anything that's happening in C out is off our critical thread. So this brings up a good opportunity to talk about some of the downsides of this. You might say, Chris, I'm so convinced by version one, I'm going to throw out my old logger, never look at it again. It's the most beautiful code I've ever seen. But you have to understand there's trade-offs to this type of programming. First off, like I said, we cannot reallocate our character buffer in the real-time thread. So we must pick a value at initialization time and stick with it. Any message that's over 512 characters is going to be truncated, and that data will be lost. Uh, furthermore, we're going to fi fix size our, uh, our logging queue. And any message over 100, in this case, is just going to be dropped on the floor. So it's really important to tune these two values to your application's uh, purposes. So, are we all done? Well, we've improved a lot. There's, we got rid of at least the printf system call. That's really great. No allocations. We're using a fixed size character buffer and a fixed size queue right at the beginning. And we're synchronizing across threads, but we're not using mutexes. So this is looking pretty good. But the fact that I'm only nine minutes into an 18-minute talk tells you maybe we're not all the way there, or I didn't plan my time that well. So what's wrong here? Like I said in the beginning, uh, we have to be super paranoid as audio engineers. We have to take nothing for granted. And what looks fishy here? Well, maybe it's this call. Again, this was something just handed to us. Are we sure that it's real-time safe? Well, if you look in the man pages, it will say something like blah, 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 Thousands and decimal separators are returned by locale conv. And what does that mean in plain English? It means these three numbers are the same exact number, just in different places in the world. So if your computer's in Norway or Thailand or United States, uh, when you call a printf family function, it's going to ask your operating system, do I use a comma here? Do I use a space here? Do I use a period here? Really unfortunate way to lose our real-time safety. But if you look at a profiler, you see a lot of words that I hate to see in my real-time <laughs> callback, lock, slow, unfair, lib system, platform, dialib, all horrendous, uh, not really what you want. You can see it's, it's spending a lot of time here, so very, very unfortunate. So. When we're looking at this, uh, are there system calls? Yes, we obviously just proved that there's some system call to the low calconv uh, function. There's a mutex that protects that function, so that's unfortunate. And now I'm not even sure that there's no allocations happening. 
So we're paranoid. We have to be paranoid. We just lost our best friend, the printf functions. Uh, but let's turn to a group possibly more paranoid than audio engineers. And who might that group be? Well, luckily for us, they exist, and they're known as embedded systems engineers. And uh, you would be paranoid, too, if you had a system with super limited resources, limited memory, a slow processor. Uh, you would hunt out every single mutex, every single allocate, uh, allocation, and eliminate them. So luckily for us, embedded systems engineers have a lot to teach us as audio engineers, and they have re-implemented the printf family functions over and over again using no allocations and no locks. So the one that I settled on for my implementation was called STB. These are built as single family or single file public domain libraries, so just one header for one function. And crucially, the STB SPrintf header, the one that we're going to use, has only two includes in the entire file. And they're just to include different types. They're all listed here. Um, you can look in the entire function for malloc or new or mutex or lock, and you will not find a one. It's beautiful, and you can use it, and it's real time safe. So, what might this look like? You take in your variable arguments just like you did before, and it's a drop in replacement. Instead of VSN printf, you're going to use STB VSN printf, pass in your VA args, and you are all good. But this brings up an important side note. Is using VARGs real-time safe? I'm saying we have to be paranoid and not trust anything. Well, the answer is yes, VARGs is real-time safe. The, uh, the way that VARGs works is all your parameters are passed in on the stack, your first one, in this case, A. Uh, you just add the size of A, and you find your next parameter. You add the size of B, you get your next parameter, and you go up like that. Everything on this slide, totally real-time safe and good to go. However, the real answer, as always, is a little bit murkier than that. If you look at some man pages, it will say, finally, on systems where arguments are passed in registers, it may be necessary for VA start to allocate memory. We were so close to something perfect, but luckily, in CPP or C++ uh, 11, there is a solution to this in variadic templates. So variadic templates, a very, very dense topic that I won't be able to get into here fully, but it might look something like this. If you're interested, please check out this talk from CPPCon. And further, this unlocks the ability to use lib format, which is the modern type safe way to do printf, func uh, printf uh, functions. So you can see the call. It looks a little bit different than we're used to. It has the curly braces, but for the rest of this talk, please bear with me and trust that printf is real-time safe on my system, at least. I don't have time to go into all of the nuances of variadic templates here. So when we look at this version that we just wrote, which is the logging thread plus our new uh, real-time safe printf function, it might look something like this, and we got rid of our system calls, we're sure there's no allocations, and there are no mutexes. So this is all good and well, but there's one more improvement that I want to make, and this is a note on ordering. So let's say you are the scheduler of your system, and you are trying to print out the numbers one, two, and three in order in the most convoluted way possible. Maybe you would do it like this across two threads. So user interface thread logs number one, your real-time callback logs the number two, and then your user interface thread calls the number three. Maybe that looks like this in a diagram. So the UI thread logs number one, and it goes directly to the file. That's really crucial. Your audio thread calls real-time log, but again, we're not going directly to the file or directly to the terminal. We are putting it in the queue for processing later. UI thread logs three in the meantime, and sometime way, way longer down the road, we're calling process log and printing the number two. What this looks like is one, three, two. You thought you could count to three, but you were off by one, so unfortunately, you won't be able to do it. So how do you solve this issue? Again, go to the issue of you got logs from a customer and you're trying to figure out what happened, but now you have a huge block of your UI logging and a huge block of your audio logging, and there's no way to re-interleave them. So the way we solved this at Spatial was an atomic sequence number. So this gives a number to the logs that you can go through and sort on and uh, figure out what happened and what time. So in your non-real-time log function, you'll increment this number when the log line is printed to the file. In your real-time log function, you're going to increment this number when the data is enqueued on the queue. Again, these are the two opportunities or the two places in which these things are happening synchronously in the threads in which they're called. So 
non-real-time log when it's actually printed, real-time log when it's put into the queue. So we get all the benefits of before, nothing has changed. Uh, we're using atomic numbers, so everything's real-time safe. And relative ordering is preserved. So down here on the bottom, we actually have a, an excerpt from one of our logs. We use a JSON flavor of a real-time log. And you can see down here at the very bottom, we can see our audio region has come in and uh, logged sometime later on. This must have been when process log was called. And it has a sequence number two, so we can just write a quick command line script to resort things by sequence number and get the relative ordering out. So, an implementation summary. This is everything we've learned, and this is the recipe to create your own real-time logger. On initialization, we're going to create a lock-free queue containing type log data plus a buffer to print into. We're going to create a thread to periodically call process logs. In the real-time log function, we're going to create a new variable of log data. We're going to fill in its buffer, and we are going to put a sequence number in it to preserve relative ordering. And we'll try to enqueue the data and not cry too much if it's dropped on the floor because we understand that trade-off. In the process log function, we're going to periodically dequeue the messages in the queue and log them. So if this seems like too much work or you just want a running example, I have put up this code in this repository on GitHub. Please check it out. It's somewhere between a uh, usable library and an example. I just know that I learn a lot better when I have usable, runnable code here. So please check it out. If you want to chat on the GitHub issues, please file an issue. So. In summary, what did we learn? Do not use normal logging in your real-time thread. You'll cause dropouts, and it'll be very sad. A real-time logger is a glorified lock-free queue that you can print messages into. Beware sneaky system calls to low calconv in the standard printf family code. You can use sequence numbers to ensure your loggers have proper ordering across real-time and non-real-time logging. Beware the possibility of data loss using the real-time logger. You will truncate and lose log lines if using the real-time logger improperly. And lastly, VARGs is real-time safe on many platforms, but variadic templates are probably the best general solution for all systems. And the good news is it unlocks the use of lib format, which is type safe as well. So that's my talk. Thank you to all my reviewers and the open source libraries. Um, does anybody have any questions? Right, so you can control the real-timeness when you enter into your printf statement, but your arguments may be evaluated at that time and they could not be real-time or other problems like that. Um, have you found any techniques to help with that? I mean, if you're using temp uh, the various templates, could you inspect to see if you're being passed a function and say, hey, don't give me functions. Don't cause me to call log or something like that in some number and be slow. Yeah, I, I think that's a really clever idea. I, I will say my template knowledge is definitely lacking in my C++ world, but that, that seems like a reasonable thing you, you could do. Uh, of course, all the normal uh, rules of real-time processing occur. You know, if you uh, have to grab something using a lock and then log it, if you're, everything's out the window. So yeah, it's up to you to enforce that or just have good real-time hygiene in general. Uh, thanks for the talk. This was very, I learned a lot. Um, I was wondering, if you care about ordering, why not just have every thread put stuff into the logging thread instead of logging from different threads? Yeah, so, so that goes back to one of the trade-offs of you have a fixed size buffer that you have to choose at uh, initialization time. So let's say you have 100 messages and you say, okay, I'm never going to resize this thing. Uh, if you end up logging too much, which, you know, maybe your database thread like spams the logs at some point, you're going to continuously drop drop things out. So that's definitely one approach, but you trade memory to do that, right? You, you have like some big stack of memory that you have to allocate right at the beginning, and that's uh, the trade-off that you use. So we use a mix of both, and the sequence number was a good way to get some of that memory back. 